right then. Um, let's we do. Let's do the rebel cell. So the the rebel cell. The whole book. The, well, the subtitle is how the counterculture became consumer culture. Um, and their argument is is. It's quite it's quite simple and quite controversial, um, and their argument is really that people um, in the West, I think they're mainly talking about North America. They people make a mistake, and they think that deviance is effective; that it's political action. So, so they think that deviating from the norm is somehow political act. They, they just disagree with all of that. So they make a distinction between deviance and dissent. All right? So, um, not going to the back of the bus because of racial segregation, protesting against that. That's dissent. That for them is political action. It's cultural political action not liking how conservative your society is and dyeing your hair pink and having a Mohican, for them that's not anything. That For them that's just nothing, that's just gesture politics and it's nothing. So that, that that's their argument, essentially. Dissent can be politically effective. Deviance, being a hippie, being a punk, being, you know, different, isn't anything. Now, we can pull that argument to pieces... But they make the argument to be polemical, to, to, to try and be kind of clear. A um, lot of people were really um, offended by by their argument. Um, I wasn't that offended by it. I thought it was quite interesting. It was, it was quite clarifying. But what happens is that they they kind of they're really down on anything that's countercultural, and they regard the counterculture as inherently, or anything countercultural, as inherently mistaken, it's a mistake, it, it's, it's wrong. And they start off their chapter, chapter 9, I'll see, we'll have to watch it on YouTube. Um, I tested these and they were fine on my computer, but they're not fine now. Uh, yeah, we'll watch it on YouTube. So they start off with this. The great thing about the HTC UK's comment with the is that we're able to bring external expertise But you can all learn about HSBC or whatever. Well. It's HSBC UK's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Whatever it is. So, this is their first objective. The chapter's quite long and it's chopped up into different sections. Alanis Morissette, have we heard of Alanis Morissette? Do we know him? Do we like Alanis Morissette? Yeah, we're, that's a definitive nod. Yeah? I love this album. I loved, I loved the first two albums. I don't know anything about anything after that. Um, so, so that's Alanis Morissette, and Heath and Potter, in their, in their book, they start the entire chapter by talking about this. Now, I think something to think about for seminars tomorrow is whether they are judging her entirely negatively and what the problem is. Um... But if we just look at this text, and so now you can you can think about it for your essays and stuff like that, or a video like this, or videos are great, adverts are great, you know, short things that are these kind of intensive injections of, of an argument or an ethos. So she starts off with, uh, we've got the music, diddly dee, thank you, uh, how about getting off of these antibiotics? Um... Because antibiotics are bad, right? <laughs> so, Heath and Potter write about this. And she's standing, she's naked. Who does she look a bit like? Culturally, mythologically, religiously, spiritually. I mean, what, what, what are the connotations? So, the denotation. She's just standing naked. Yep. It's like Venus or um, Eve. Venus or... Eve, like Adam and Eve. Or Eve. Venus... 
Eve, anything else? I mean, it's. I was thinking Eve as well. Have we got any other? Um, it's <laughs> kind of if you're thinking about her in like the history of the hippie kind of movement, kind of like uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. They love to have photographs when they're both nude. That's another way station along the way of all of these kind of intertextual allusions or references. She's 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 like Eve. She she's so she, oh she's also like some kind of state of nature. She might be like Rousseau's noble savage. She's also like got some amazing contacts going on here. She's like she's a seer. She she can. It's almost like look at the eyes. She's like totally off a bunt on something or. She can see more deeply, right? She's got a third eye open or something. Wow, man. It's really trippy, this, this India thing. Um, getting off antibiotics, I mean, from where we're standing today, culturally, politically sometimes, the whole, like, anti-Western medicine thing <laughs> is back. That's something that, that's a really interesting theme to look into. Anti-vax, anti, well, anti-vax especially, but anti-Western um, medicine. So she's Eve, she's Yoko Ono, or she's in hair, or she's, you know, she's, she's something like that. So there's the whole hippie thing going on. But then the whole hippie thing is potentially a reference back to this state of nature, purity, innocence, noble savage. And, I mean, it's functioning like a semiotic contrast. She's naked in a city. She's naked on a subway train. She's she, she's she's people are physically in contact with her. Like we don't do that. We don't go naked in society. We don't go naked on public transport. People don't touch each other. We're all on antibiotics. There's these carrots that are dangled that we're chasing constantly with our careers. But you go to India. Alanis goes to India, and she find nothingness, she finds terror, she finds disillusionment, she, or maybe she had all of that and they sent it to India. And she's thanking India, so she's, I mean, that's kind of orientalist. You can, there's an orientalism here. And Heath and Potter argue there's a counter-cultural thinking here, which is, this is a critique of the West, it's a critique of American cities, American, or Canadian maybe, modernity, and she does so by referring to this other, this other place, this otherworldly place. Thank you, India, as a spiritual place, more natural. So, I mean, the question for you to think about is, and for me, why do Heath and Potter have a problem with this? Like, why pick on Alanis Morissette? What's, what's so wrong with that? I'm not sure how, what the verdict would be on that. But they argue that this type of thinking is a classic Western mistake. It's like you've just made a category mistake. It's about, it's like a complete, the, the, it's the fantasy of a complete rejection of the modern world, the modern Westernized world. And they look at, through this chapter, they look at a whole history of Westerners um, and themselves being involved in this sort of counter-cultural rejection. So they're not fans of the counterculture. And the reason why this is interesting is because um, it might help you to think, well, hang on a minute, I, maybe I disagree with them. Maybe, are they entirely right or are they entirely wrong? These alternative lifestyles and alternative ideologies, they think that they're all um, mistaken. So they, they write, um, one can indulge in the exotic through travel to places like India and Central America through the adoption of the religious beliefs and rituals of the Chinese uh, or of American Indians or simply by adopting the speech, clothing and cultural habits of others such as talking in dialect or wearing batik or doing yoga. In every case, the goal is the same, to throw off the chains of technocratic modernity and to achieve the revolution in consciousness that will allow us to live a more authentic life. This is what they say the counter-cultural critique is. Throw off the chains of your mind, the chains of convention, the chains of orthodoxies in the West, 
and you, you look for a more authentic life. Um, and I think that they're correct in identifying this tradition. I think they're correct um, in, in talking about this. And I think that the terms they bring to the debate are useful as well. Like the idea of a complete rejection, that's still common, right? People still try, people still want to leave, get out of the rat race, get out of the mainstream, get, get free from this, right? And then the concept of a more authentic life, the concept of authenticity, which is a really um, complicated concept. Um, in the past, I've, I've just told students, like, as soon as you see this, a claim of authenticity or natural should set alarm bells off in your head because there's an argument going on here. But now I think it's maybe more complicated than that. I think that we've got to think about what we take authenticity to be. Like, what are our criteria for a sense of authenticity? Um, so I'll read this quote. I've obviously put this here for a reason. I can't remember what it is, though. The greatest weakness of countercultural thinking has always been its inability to produce a coherent vision of a free society, much less a practical political program for changing the one that we live in. This is their problem. So Heath and Potter say that they both grew up, they both were kind of countercultural, they were both punks at different times, they were both into these different things, and they were travellers and they did all this stuff. But then when they grew up, they thought, hang on, what did that actually achieve? What did that do? What did it change? And their argument is similar to a lot of the arguments we've encountered so far, is that really, that sort of ethos just finds a market, it just, it's just a demand that finds a supply, so you can start to buy into a countercultural lifestyle, you start to consume your yoga goods, your healthy, you know, your natural ancient dietary styles, and so on and so on. It's just a new form of consumerism, that's their argument. Um, and so, I guess, Maybe they started with Alanis Morissette because she's, although she's being very nice and she's hoping for nice things and she's like, let's stop taking all these medications, let's get out of the rat race, let's be more genuine with, with each other, let's maybe meditate, let's do some good stuff. They're saying that's just, that's not going to change anything. So, it's going to change something though, it might, but anyway. So, the turn towards ex yet the turn towards exoticism has encouraged widespread denial of this problem by suggesting that some other culture just over the horizon possesses some completely different way of thinking and acting, one that will allow us to escape from the iron cage of modernity. Countercultural rebels have spent decades in search of this magical get out of jail free card, from the madness of the Cultural Revolution in China to the peyote patches of the Mojave Desert. Yet more often than not, what these encounters have produced is less than genuine. By projecting their own desires and longing onto other cultures, countercultural rebels have essentially constructed the exotic as a reflection of their own ideology. So, Heath and Potter have no time and no place for this, and they argue that the difference between thinkers like Flaubert and Rousseau in the past is that they've, they've used their interest in um, foreign cultures to specifically critique existing institutions, but that the counterculture today, the modern counterculture from the 1960s onwards, has not done that, has just gone, throw it all away, burn everything. Right? And it's not being used as a, as a true critique. It's being used as an imaginary escapist fantasy. That's their problem with it. It's like it sort of pretends or presents itself as somehow political to be a punk, to be a hippie, to live an alternative lifestyle. But the question is, what does that do? Like for them, as maybe people who are interested in, in politics and, and, and changing culture or changing society for the better, what does it do? And they look at a range of examples, so in, the, in what remains of this, of this lecture I'm going to go through some of the, the things that they talk about because I know that I have to pitch this to you to encourage you to read. How many people have already read the Heath and Potter? Read the other text. Read the other one, okay. 
So I know that this is really, this is just plus my hard sell, isn't it, right? So here's why you should read it. <laughs> we should read it. You, at the moment we can't get access to the second text easily because the library is it's not working for some reason. But the Heath and Potter, you have the PDF, and it's really interesting and there's more than enough to talk about there. They talk about a movement called the Voluntary Simplicity Movement, which they identify as an American movement that started in the 1980s. And they, they kind of challenge a lot about that. And a lot of what they find here, in much the same way that other thinkers that we've, we've already referred to on the module have found, is that often things like this, they're, they're very, very privileged lifestyle choices. Middle class people can afford to do this stuff. It's the middle classes and the more affluent who can choose their macrobiotic diet, their paleo diet, their whatever diet. They can spend their time doing yoga, doing... They can buy all these goop products, right? They can do all of that because they have the financial ability to do so. But it's not a cultural... It's not a progressive cultural movement. It doesn't necessarily enable any great change. It just means that you can afford to do this stuff. Um, it's like that there was a, there's a, a podcast. I know I'd said I didn't really listen to podcasts. I occasionally listen to some podcasts. There's a podcast called Taking Down the Gurus, and they looked at Joe Rogan. And Joe Rogan, who is like the, he's the, the one with all the controversial stuff on Spotify, right? He's that one, the one that was in the news before they had real news to talk about. Um, Joe Rogan's like anti vax. Because, and this is the really great bit, because if you're as rich as him, you can buy all of these other medications that cost considerably more than the vaccine. You're like, hang on a minute, Joe. And, and he's, you know, so he can work out all the time, he's, he, can, he can do all these healthy things, he's in the gym every day, and, and it leads to this strange logic of thinking where, like, well, a vaccine has economies of scale, we can give that to everyone, and, you know, it, people might get better, or might not get COVID, or might not die, or might not be hospital. And he's like, no, fuck that. <laughs> You've got to be more manly than that. You need this, like, veterinary medicine, and you need saunas, and you need all this sort of weird. Anyway, no more Joe Rogan. Well, not yet. Maybe. Joe Rogan is just like goop for men. Right? Joe Rogan is essentially like the grr, alpha male, I like guns, goop product, which we can talk about. So the other thing that Heath and Potter um, go after is are these, these myths, these binaries. Western world this, Eastern world that. Western world consumerist, Eastern world mystical. And they go, hang on, if you actually look, just even glance, at East Asia, at India. It's not some kind of mystical Eden. It's hyper-consumption, conspicuous consumption, ultra. And they talk about all the, the different delicacies and different fashions of, of like Japanese and Chinese cuisine and so on. It's like, you can't say that that's outside of consumerism. If you actually stop fantasizing about the East and just look at it and go, oh, hang on a minute, these binaries that the countercultural thinking um, is organised by fall to pieces on, on, on empirical kind of scrutiny. They also do a number on the fantasy of, of um, Native Americans, um, American Indians, um, the idea that they were living in harmony with nature and that they were spiritual and that they didn't kind of just exterminate buffalo and they didn't just do these horrific things to each other and to animals and to nature. They're like, this is a fantasy that was invented by Westerners who didn't know anything about these cultures, uh, which leads them into the, the Mother Earth thesis, this idea of Mother Earth or Gaia, the Gaia hypothesis, that the Earth is essentially one organism um, interacting, and that we have to have to go after its harmony, the harmony of all the points. And there's, I mean, this kind of idea 
is it exists in in, in lo- the idea of a body politic is one that has existed in in kind of European thinking. It's existed in Chinese thinking. It's existed everywhere. That you know the state of nature. There's an order, a hierarchy, a balance. But this is a 1970s Western idea that was projected onto communities and entities and identities like Native Americans in particular, because it's, it's a North American sort of a concept. So they do a number on that. A lot of our ideas that we think, it's a bit like the willow pattern Chinese crockery. It's not Chinese. It was invented in England. It just, it's chinoiserie. And this is kind of um, vague, naturalistic kind of fantasy about a time before the West ruined everything by digging mines, building ships, and putting nuclear power stations everywhere. Which leads them to interrogate the notion of authenticity, um, which is a very, very interesting concept. And this one is potentially for you and your essays a minefield, right? This is a one where you could be you could be flying along, <laughs> you're doing your essay, and then you go, and this is authentic, and that's not, and I just go and shoot you down, and you go, sorry, you were looking at a first there, and you do authenticity. The Native American blah, blah, blah is authentic. The ancient Chinese blah, blah, blah is authentic. It isn't. We're not dealing with that. We're dealing with something more complex than that. What is authentic? What's an authentic experience? They, they look at the kind of structure of what we think authenticity is. And, I, um, and it's, their, their debate is interesting. And it's something that we can definitely talk about and we should talk about. Like, what even is authenticity? How do we go and have an authentic experience Either here, there, or, you know, we, we, we go to China, we go to Thailand, we go somewhere, go to Malaysia, right? How do we have an authentic experience? What is one? What does it look like? How much does it cost? Ooh, as soon as you start paying for it, it mustn't be authentic, right? But hang on a minute, what, why not? Why would it not be authentic? I told you the anecdote many weeks ago in ancient history, back at the start of this module, right, about friends who went to visit Paris. And this guy whose family lived, said, I'll come on, I'll take it. And he across Paris, out into the suburbs, Chinese restaurant. And they were like, uh-huh. this is not an authentic Parisian experience. Because <laughs> we, want, we want, you know, cheese and touristy stuff and cobbled streets and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, that's what we want. So think about that. Authenticity is a useful and important thing for you to think about. What is it? How does it happen? In what way can it be said to be actually authentic and not just some kind of sometimes cynical, sometimes not cynical construct? Um, and I think this is their most scathing, their most scathing critique of countercultural hippie traveller rejection of West ideology takes the form of their analysis of the novel and film The Beach. 2000 um, film, so let's have a look at the trailer for it. So who's seen the beach? Some of you have seen the beach, okay. Um, so Heath and Park, they use it as, um, as a distillation of everything that's wrong with the Western countercultural rejection of um, the normal world and the desire for the exotic because in the beach you're dealing with a character a young American traveller he's in Bangkok and he's bored you go all the way to Bangkok and you're like just watching sport in a bar going so he's trying new experiences to get away from the same and he does all sorts of weird shit and he drinks snake's blood and he does all sorts of things to, to, to have a, an, a new experience. But it's never good enough for him. It's never new or different enough. So he hears the, this story about the beach where some true people, like some true seekers, have really put in the effort to find this paradise. Eden on Earth, which is often, you know, this is, if we've got Orientalism, the Orient, right, in Saeed's thinking, is like Eden. It, 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 it's paradise. So we need to find this true paradise on earth, this orientalist fantasy. 
And they go to the beach, and what Heath and Potter note is that the thing that makes it paradise for the Western travellers is the lack of natives, the lack of Easterners, the, the lack of Thai people in this case, actually there. They don't want actual people like trying to sell them things and buy things off them and, and have an actual society. They want a fantasy. They don't want reality at all. They want a fantasy escape. And so they say a lot of very critical things about that kind of impulse and impetus in, in countercultural thinking um, inspired by the beach. And you can do that too. You can find a text that illustrates something. That might be a film, might be an episode of, I don't know, Black Mirror or it might, whatever it might be. It might be an advert or a song. It might reflect your ongoing interest in the practice that you can, that you can um, bring to bear on your, your essays and your analysis. Um, and then towards the end, and this one is more current today than it was when they wrote this book, they reference the debate, the ongoing debate that's pitched as an East-West debate between Western versus alternative, sometimes traditional Chinese medicine, sometimes other forms of medicine, and they say, well, really what this is, is a debate between allopathic versus homeopathic medicine. Allopathic medicine is the one where something caused your illness, a bacterium, a virus, something caused it. So you get an injection or take a tablet or just ride it out or whatever. It was a thing that caused you to be unwell. Homeopathic medicine is more about the, the structure of the entity, the organism. What are you taking in? What's going out? What is the environment in which you live? Right. All sorts of, there's lots of different versions of homeopathic medicine. What's the star sign? <laughs> What's your star sign? Right? <laughs> Where do you live? Is your wardrobe in the wrong place? Have you been eating too many biscuits? Right? Things like that. That's, 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 that's one ridiculous caricature of homeopathic medicine. And they, unsurprisingly given the direction of travel of this book, Right, and their argument. Which one do you think they plump for? They plump for allopathic. And they argue that a lot of the interests in uh, traditional, alternative, non-mainstream, non-Western medicine, it's part of this fantasy, Orientalist countercultural fantasy. And also, they raise the question, like, why wouldn't these companies... Why wouldn't Pfizer and Procter and & Gamble and all these people, why wouldn't they monetize something? Why wouldn't they go, oh, that herb then, that everyone says is really good, why don't we extract the active ingredient from that and monetize it and sell it as a medicine? Because they, they say, well, they would definitely do all of that because that's what these people are. That's what Big Pharma is. That's why we hate them. Because they monetize medicines that actually work. And if you can't extract an active ingredient from it, that's because you can't extract an active ingredient from it, because there isn't one, right? That's, the, that's Ethan Potter's argument. But another market has arisen which sells this stuff and goes, oh, this is like 8,000 years old from Atlantis, and this is, you know, 58,000 years old from somewhere else, and this is ancient, you just need to have this with a crystal. You were talking about crystals the other day. Um, um, that's another market, and it's, it's not really, it's not even alternative, it's just a market. It's a wellness ma market that is, that that's kind of rejects science, because science picks up and monetizes things that can be proven in different ways. So, some of you will disagree with this, and I'm not entirely sure that I agree with what I'm saying at the minute, but I'm, I'm saying, setting out their argument. I, there's part of me that's very... Very, I'm very homeopathic in some ways. Like, I, you know, they say, like, you know, if you eat, um, if you eat local honey, then you probably not. That's good for you or something, and you're not going to. Nah. Well, I've translated that, and, and I know for a fact, right? I've, I've tested this. If you drink local ale, you don't get ill. You stay super healthy, like me. <laughs> that last bit was a joke, but I do actually also believe it. Right? And there's a lot of stuff, actually, it's, it, there's, it, this isn't a digression, but a, a potentially interesting one. 
Interest in the immune system with COVID-19. COVID-19, respiratory, immune system, ah, a whole world of entrepreneurs sprang up in this area going, strengthen your immune system and your lungs. Do this Wim Hof breathing thing where you hold your breath for as long as you possibly can and then you have a shower in really cold water and that's 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 kind of homeopathic it's like you you do some pranayama yoga breathing and that'll make you stronger if you get covid it might even ward it off and take herbs and things and some vitamin d and right i'm a bit of both obviously i'm vaccinated to the hilt i would have another one now I'll do a, another one this afternoon if it meant I could go around licking everyone. Like, <laughs> shall I move on? Um, <laughs> so that's Ethan Potter. They end they end actually with a kind of him in praise of the business trip, and they say that they argue actually that the only authentic type of cross cultural encounter is an international business trip because it's honest and it reflects economic reality and you go to another country, the, the relationship is always either going to be exploitative or transactional in some way. So they kind of go, everyone hates the business trip, everyone hates business travellers. Just like we, you know, if, if, if we're kind of backpackers, we hate tourists. You know, if you backpack somewhere and you've backpacked all the way up a mountain and a coachload of tourists is at the top, you're like, and you're sweating and dirty, and you're like, oh man, and your phone's on 20%, and they've just got off an air-conditioned Wi-Fi bus. That pisses you off, and you hate them people. And you hate business people even more. So they quite polemically say, actually, the business trip's the only authentic trip. So that's Ethan Potter. Um, and then I'm not going to um, spend too much time with the... the the buying Buddha selling Rumi um, text because I don't think we'll have access to it in time for tomorrow but you can refer back to it. She talks about muddled orientalism as sustaining a marketplace. That's her argument. That Western consumerism um, picks up heterogeneous bits and pieces from other cultures or invents them and, and they function in a new marketplace of alternative practices and interests. Um, I might display some of this into, into next week when we look at the figure of the, the mystic in cinema and in, in film. The connection of, of um, you know, alternative lifestyles with wellness. Um, so I'll skip this. I might sl slot some of it back in later or you can read this and, and, and read um, um, uh, Sophie, uh, Rose or Jana when you get a chance. But I thought I'd just finish off with a few little examples that I sort of was thinking about and found um, when um, when I was writing this lecture. And the big one, obviously I've mentioned Joe Rogan, I've mentioned Goop, I've mentioned Gwyneth Paltrow. There's something sort of vaguely countercultural in in this. Gwyneth Paltrow is, a, is an influencer, very definitely a celebrity. So the NHS, so this was last year, this was um, February 21, the NHS has urged Gwyneth Paltrow to stop promoting misinformation after she suggested that long COVID is treatable with intuitive fasting, herbal cocktails and visits to an infrared sauna. Paltrow started a keto and plant-based diet, fasting until 11am every day and then consuming lots of coconut aminos and sugar-free kombucha and kimchi, she wrote. I'm doing an infrared sauna as often as I can. All in service of healing, she added, as well as recommended Goop's herbal non-alcoholic cocktails. So this is the wellness industry, right? She's a representative of her. I don't necessarily want to, this to be like a, a Gwyneth Paltrow hating session or anything. It's like she just represents something. And as I mentioned earlier, her male counterpart is Joe Rogan. Absolutely, right? He's equivalent. He's the flip side. He's the same. But for men who like guns and boots. <laughs> uh, so what's going on here? This is, this is what Sophie Arjan would call like, it's um, confused Orientalism. It's like, yeah, we know kimchi is good for you. We know kombucha is good for you. And she kind of invents her own homeopathic approach to systemic wellness. Which is, it's no bad thing. I do it. 
God, I feel a bit rough. I better have a few beers. Local ones with some honey on. Honey flavoured beer, that's why I'm out. Um, what? I just have some mead, some Lindisfarne mead. Yeah. <laughs> but this was interesting. I didn't know about this. I, I, I did a search for something I was looking up. There were claims uh, that I'd, I'd heard floating around somewhere that that tai chi, doing Tai Chi helped something to do with the vaccine. Like, it did something. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So I was looking that up. Um, and I came across the Novak Djokovic uh, issue. So Djokovic, who you may recall, um, is not vaccinated and was not allowed to compete in uh, tennis competitions in Australia because in Australia they're very strict about vaccination. Um, and I read about his um, uh, the reasons why he wasn't vaccinated. And there's a lot of kind of what we might call orientalist or sort of countercultural thinking in there. So the only bit that I've grabbed from this page is the Serb maintains he has always been a great student of wellness, well-being, health and nutrition, and that his decision over the COVID vaccine has been partly influenced by the positive effects of changing his diet and sleeping patterns. So he's gone for a, a homeopathic approach to COVID. He's had COVID anyway. But he also is like, well, I eat this food. I eat clean. I eat ancient. I eat authentic. I do Tai Chi. I do yoga. I do mindfulness. I do... And there's, an, there's this sort of interesting pseudo-scientific, couldn't really prove it, couldn't really disprove it, discourse that goes along side of, of these debates. Um, so, you know, that's something, that, that uh, these are just examples that I've pulled out from um, um, the internet over the last few days. We, I looked, we looked at this the other week. Um, I'm a little bit obsessed with this. It's a bit like, you know, when you've got like a, re a pain, like a real pain somewhere and you have to keep going back and prodding it and testing like, oh, really this, ow, 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 ow. Hey you, this hey you fitness thing. Um, so, hey you, don't just, don't just do Qigong, like we looked at in some of the seminars. They do everything. They do all sorts of stuff. There's, they sell little sticks that you can hit yourself with that come from ancient traditions, non-European of course. An integrated approach to wellness. Modern living, We've got an, a, a, there should be a modern living alarm bell going off there, has an acknowledged and detrimental effect on our health. Right? Did you know that? Oh, and on our beauty and wellness. Because <laughs> these are equally important, right? Our health and our beauty uh, are very important. The knock-on effects of our lifestyle trigger everything from poor sleep, and bad skin to weight gain, anxiety, and multiple chronic illnesses. The solution? Chinese medicine. A natural healing system that has been used by millions of people for thousands of years and offers a wealth of techniques that protect your health. The groundbreaking Hey You method distills this remarkable holistic philosophy into easy but pleasurable technique. Not unpleasant. There's nothing unpleasant here. It has to be pleasurable. Right? Treat yourself well to relieve stress, enliven your complexion and supercharge your well-being. No pill popping, crash diets or plastic waste. This is like pure countercultural ideology commodified, distilled. Like the rituals are like these kind of rituals. Not like, you know, getting up at 5am and running for 10 miles rituals. It's proper like this kind of ritual. Rituals like that. <laughs> so, and the thing is, right, I, I laugh at this, but actually, if, you, if I reflect and think truly about me, uh, I have been known to think I'll be absolutely fine. Even if I get COVID, I'm so nails that I'll, I'll be fine. I'll just laugh it off. Does anyone else do that? I've eaten really healthily. I used to do Wim Hof when I was bored during lockdown. I've done Qigong today. There's no virus going to get through my chi. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, so we can use these things to... We can, really, we can really critique them. We could do a Slavoj Žižek on this or a Heathen Potter and just destroy this. We can also do a fact check on it, right? And go, traditional Chinese medicine, thousands of years? Okay. Google, hello. 
Is today is oh the, the very notion of TCM what that was invented in about 1940 was it okay okay it's more complicated so we can we can do that but we can also go well what are the cultural like what is this answering what cultural anxieties what needs is it answering and what is it avoiding it's avoiding pale popping crash diet plastic waste effort it's avoiding lots of stuff like that so it's it's middle class it's individualistic. It sounds nice. It's eco. No plastic waste. Right? So you can, we can look at it and go, okay, I don't just want you to ridicule stuff. I mean, I'm joking. It's a lecture. I'm trying to keep you awake, right? But um, you can have your laugh at something, but then go, actually, seriously, what's going on here? Why this? Why now? You know, it's like at the, at the start of the... Um, at the start of the, the lecture, you know, we're looking at why for a historical period of time was an interest, was the interest in China? Why did that fade? Why did India rise? And you can see the kind of global reasons why that happens. We can ask the same questions of these little examples that we will, that we will pull out. Um, we haven't really got time to look at Ayurvedic wellness spas. Uh, also, we haven't really got time to look at healing crystals. But um, this is a, this isn't... Excellent, excellent short film about healing crystals. You know, just just go to go to YouTube, healing crystals, Orientalism, healing crystals, right? It's 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 fabulous. It's a fabulous topic, and thank you for who raised it. You you had insight into it, but it, that someone else just raised it as a question in a seminar. I'd forgotten about crystals. Um, fabulous topic. What else do we have next? Oh yeah, um, the, there's a, a video. Um, from there's a lot of stuff, so this is not counterculture anymore because these these idea it is the counterculture has many different directions, and it actually goes into interest in like how do you run a business according to say Buddhist principles? What does Buddha say? What does Winnie the Pooh say about running a business? It's like that kind of level of stuff, and there's a ton of these types of things out there. Also, like books like *The Art of War*, um, *The Book of Five Rings*. And *The Art of War* is about this military strategy. *The Book of Five Rings* is about how to kill people with swords. And and it's they're translated into um, business collections. Like it, it's it, these different cultural ideologies function um, in certain contexts in different ways. So they were just a few extra things that I thought of. Um, and we'll talk about them. Do read the Heath and Potter, and we will in the seminars talk about things like authenticity and um, you know experience and and so on. Um, any questions? I'm going to finish there. I'm going to finish early today. But um, if you have questions, no? all right then. I'll see you tomorrow.